it's a weird world that we live in because on one hand, there's a lot of skepticism for docs that are in the traditional world because those are the docs that are slinging opioids, those are the yeah. docs that are doing unnecessary surgeries. Mm -hmm. But then on the world that has is still fairly experimental, for some reason, patients trust those docs and are like, all right, I'm gonna give you $10,000 to put things God knows where. So it's this weird dichotomy, it's this weird uh, unbalance that's occurred in, in the musculoskeletal world right now. I'm Heidi again, and we're here today with Dr. Patel at HealthLink Medical Center. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Patel and have ask him to just tell us a little bit about your background and kind of your education, what you do here at HealthLink. Sure. Um, so my name is Shanak Patel. Um, uh, my background is in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, actually, I'm a, a DO, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, um, and I did my physical medicine and rehabilitation training uh, over on the East Coast at Kessler Institute of Rehabilitation. Um, and after that, I did a fellowship in sports medicine and interventional pain management. Uh, since then, I've actually been uh, focusing my practice on regenerative medicine and what's called interventional orthopedics. So using a patient's own biologics in order to treat various different orthopedic injuries, pain conditions, um, and trying to basically keep people away from surgery uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Sure. Um, I've been interested in that for years. I, I first had my first exposure to regenerative medicine back when I was in medical school, and I, I was really attracted to the idea of the body being able to heal itself. Um, so I, I kind of searched it out along the way, and, and it's been uh, an amazing journey to see patients get such great improvement without things like cortisone injections and opioids, opioids. And, yeah. And <laughs> so it's it's been a really great uh, trip, and and I, I love working with great physical therapists like yourself. Thank you. Uh, that are <laughs> like minded because unfortunately there's not a lot of uh, great physical therapists that are out there. There's a lot that are very cookie cutter. Um, yeah. But I nod my head like yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, you know you're doing all the work. Um, and what I do with the, the treatments that we have are really just uh, um, helping along the process mm -hmm. of, of what you're doing. So it's a great collaboration. Absolutely. And you know, working with you has been fantastic. And I, I know I've said this before, but the fact that of the all of the education that you provide to patients is one of the reasons I like working with you the most because so many people come in, people come into me and they don't know what these interventions are, number one. And number two, they see providers who are, are providing them with a variation of this, but being given very little education of what they're receiving, what to do about it. You know, so they have very little expectation of what they should experience. And people think that this is like an overnight deal. Like I have this and like cortisone or my opioids, I should feel better in the morning, which as we both know is not exactly the case. And um, there's a lot of confusion, you know, so it's really good to be able to bring more information for the general public, and especially, you know, the patient populations that I deal with, um, so that there are, I don't know, there's just, this is kind of more light to shed on this, because as you know, like, I greatly believe in this and would prefer to see patients doing this type of intervention versus a surgery or medications or anything, other things that really don't necessarily help their overall health, sure. you know? Sure. Or I have a lot of more potential consequences, scar tissue buildup, you know, failed surgeries, addiction problems, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, well, with traditional medicine, mm -hmm. um, traditional orthopedic care, right? Yes. Um, it's really algorithmic. It's really looking at what's the pain generator and, and how can we treat that pain generator, but it's not really looking at what caused the pain in the first place. Right. Um, and that's where um, physical therapy, physiatry, uh, regenerative medicine really has its forte because we're trying to look at things from all angles. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get the body to do the things that the body should be doing. Right. Better um, function. Better function. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really the purpose in the end. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting. The, the world of regenerative medicine and... and most people think of regenerative medicine and think of the word stem cell, yes. um, and, and that's been gaining popularity, and mm. it's become sexy over the past few years, right. a lot of media attention. and Sports and people. And sports people, um, so a lot of good attention, but then yeah. also a lot of bad attention, because quite frankly, there's a lot of clinics that are just making these vague and random you know, claims. Mm. 
things. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you know, we're gonna inject these stem cells into your IV stream and yeah. treat your knee arthritis and your Alzheimer's and yeah. your multiple sclerosis, and you know, we can inject your kid and treat their autism. And it's this whole spectrum of claims that are being made that are really, really unsubstantiated. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's the, it really is the stem cell wild west right now. Yeah. Um, and and that's why you know I I, I like educating people because. Quite frankly, there are benefits that could be had from these, but these aren't the panacea. This isn't no, something it's not that a can miracle. cure everything. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, we've got to be realistic about what things can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, there's a lot of stuff that we just don't know at this right. point. Medicine's too new. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I think there's a lot of um, kind of a veil of mystery, too, about where do stem cells come from? You know, it's there's all of the kind of talk about, you know, kind of... Um, like the black market of stem cells and like where are these coming from and I think that there's a lot of concern and confusion regarding that too yeah. you know and and you know kind of where do you source these how do you get them so we can kind of talk about that maybe in our case study here sure, absolutely. so we've seen a number of patients together yeah. and which has been fantastic and me being one of your patients you know so like I won't show my my wing situation here, <laughs> but but you know one of our, our most kind of interesting cases has been Tammy's case, and so let's kind of talk about her a little bit, and I can kind of start us off talking about kind of her prehab before your procedures, and then we can kind of go back and forth. Yeah. Um. So Tammy um is a mother of two. Her oldest is around 24, and she's had low back pain, pelvic pain issues very literally since her first child was born. And she's um, had a myriad of treatments and she and I have gone back and forth for a number of conditions over the year, um, years. But a couple of years ago, maybe two now, she had that spontaneous rupture of her plantar fascia. And she came to me saying, you know, I've been in these like high heeled work shoes and like my foot's really hurting and you know, I don't know what to do about it. And when she came in, we started working and doing tissue work through the plantar fascia and discovered that there was a space large enough I could basically fit my thumb inside of it. Yeah. In which case I sent her to a, an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon to get further evaluation. And fortunately, that surgeon, after doing an MRI, I was really happy that he just flat out said, like, surgery is not the best option for you. And I had told her kind of the same thing. I was like, listen, like, we surgery should be our last, res you know, last resort because these just don't heal well. Yeah. And in this case, after that surgeon agreed, which I will forever be grateful for, I referred her to you. And so, like, maybe we can talk a little bit about your evaluation of her and the first round of procedures that happened. Sure. So when, when I first saw Tammy, um, obviously her main concern was her foot. Mm -hmm. um, she told me kind of she had this back stuff that was going on yeah. and on and off for a while. That wasn't her main concern. She was doing fairly well with that for right. all intents and purposes. Um, but she had this, this bottom of her foot pain in that, that plantar fascia area, mm -hmm. right? And we see this all the time. This happens for various different reasons. High heels being one of them. Yeah. Um, that being said, I thought it was kind of weird that, you know, she had this one-sided foot pain. Mm -hmm. She had not changed her footwear dramatically. No. Um, she was doing the usual amount of walking and standing <laughs> that she was normally doing. So I was like, what's causing this? What's going on? Right. Um, and that's something that I think that, that, you know, when you go to, you have foot pain, you go to the foot specialist, mm -hmm. um, that a lot of times we end up being, you know, very Tunnel focused. vision, yeah. Exactly. Um, and just kind of looking at that. But when we're talking about function, we, we have to take the whole body into perspective, mm -hmm. right? So I examined her and I realized when examining her that she had a little subtle weakness um, in her foot and, and actually in her hip coming from her low back. Right. So the, the, the nerves in the low back are in charge of the muscles of the legs, as mm -hmm. we know, right? The, so those nerves, I tell patients all the time, the nerves are like the electrical wiring that yeah. go to the muscles, which are our appliances. So if those nerves are not firing properly, the muscles aren't going to work properly. Sure. And in that sense, the muscles are in charge of how we move our <laughs> legs and move our feet, right? Mm -hmm. So she had, had this gradual nerve irritation that had been developing over however long. 20 plus years. Right? Yeah. So, you know, ultimately something happened. There was a straw that broke the camel's back, essentially, mm -hmm. and she was starting to put abnormal pressure into sure. her foot. So the plantar fascia, it, you know, really makes up the, the the bottom of the foot, mm -hmm. and, and it is a part of the arch. It is essentially a, a strong tissue that stabilizes the bottom of the foot. Um, but that 
tissue actually comes from the heel, which comes from the calf muscle. And we've got that fascial chain just all the way up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then if the lower lumbar nerves, the L5-S1 nerves are involved, S1 nerve is involved with the calf. Yeah. So that abnormal pushing, pulling of that, that calf muscle mm -hmm. ultimately pulled on the Achilles tendon, ultimately was pulling on the plantar fascia abnormally. Yeah. And over time, that fascia, you know, the, the fibers of the fascia were probably getting gradually disorganized as mm -hmm. those fibers were being pulled abnormally. So that, you know, wearing heels one day and all of a sudden some yeah. of those fibers broke off and she had a, a more significant tear. Mm -hmm. So in evaluating that, I was like, shoot, you know, we need to get the nerves functioning better in the low back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in addition to obviously treating the, the, the plantar fascia of her yeah. foot. Well, starting from the spine and kind of working your way down. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the first treatment that we did was actually um, treating the foot and the plantar fascia um, but also addressing the low back. Mm -hmm. So you basically essentially did two injection sites. Correct. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I won't get into the nitty gritty of the details about what mm -hmm. exactly I was injecting in the low back, um, mostly because it was like over two years ago, so I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> what we used were the growth factors from her blood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can go through what, what that means. Yeah, um, we'll circle back. Yeah, but essentially um, we, we make these pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mixtures from mm -hmm. the blood. Uh, one that's very commonly heard of these days in the media and everything is called PRP, or mm -hmm. platelet-rich plasma. Uh, so we make variations of that, and I inject it around the area of her low back to provide some increased stability to the low back, sure. to take pressure off of the nerves. I also inject it along the nerves uh, to get those nerves functioning better. Mm -hmm. um, and then I inject it um, into the plantar fascia directly, using image guidance, x-ray guidance for the low back, and ultrasound guidance for the, mm -hmm. uh, the foot itself. Um, and she did mediocre. So, yeah. so she there was some closure. I mean, that gap, you know, we saw in the MRI, like the gap started to close. Yeah. It wasn't, but it didn't resolve the problem. Well, it was interesting because um, her back symptoms and some of the, the weakness in her leg had mm -hmm. actually improved yes. um, when I followed up with her a couple months later. Mm -hmm. um, her foot pain kind of improved, but not really. No, she was still struggling and yeah. going through a lot of different shoes that she was you know having a hard time kind of flip-flopping between shoes and arch supports and all the stuff trying to get comfortable absolutely and i think that that's important too that you mentioned like your follow-up was a couple months later like it wasn't like three days later it was right. like a couple months because we're talking about regeneration like we're trying to get the body to regenerate and the healing process takes time it's not an overnight sort of deal. Correct. Um, and, and in this situation is regeneration. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of situations yeah. where we're not actually doing regenerative medicine. We, right. we could talk about that. But in, in this situation, I wanted to try to heal that plantar fascia as mm -hmm. much as possible. So we were like, shoot, we're not getting the results we want. Let's do a repeat MRI. Mm -hmm. Actually, to my surprise, the, the, the tear inside the fascia mm -hmm. had actually healed predominantly. But the fascia was still thickened and it still had disorganized fibers. Right. Um, she also had some other things going on with the ankle joint um, that may have been contributing to some instability, some irritation to the tendons yes. around her ankle. And she had that kind of old ankle injury, which probably played in. Right, and, exactly. Yeah. So it was all some mechanical stuff that mm -hmm. was just preventing her from healing appropriately. Mm -hmm. So then we were like, you know what, what do we do at this juncture? The, the healing had been progressing fairly well, despite her symptoms not improving yeah. as much as we'd like. Um, so the discussion that I had with her was like, you know, maybe we should just repeat the PRP mm -hmm. um, to try to get things to heal. But she's like, look, I've been dealing with this for so long. Yeah. Let's hit it with all it's got, uh, all we've got. So basically, um, the other options in terms of treatment, um, there are other things that um, may be beneficial for this type of situation. Mm -hmm. There's actually some research that suggests that uh, amniotic allograft, okay. so this is tissue from um, uh, pregnancy mm -hmm. um, that is donated, um, yeah. it's cleaned, it is not a stem cell treatment, but mm -hmm. it is containing growth factors. Sure. Um, there is some evidence that suggests that that may be beneficial for specifically plantar fascia. Okay. Um, and then our biggest gun that we are using um, is the stem cells from a patient's own bone marrow. Sure. So that isn't coming from the blood, like we're talking about the PRP. This is coming from like the hip or the pelvis. Correct. Yeah. Correct. 
And, and that is essentially the biggest gun that we have. Mm -hmm. From the bone marrow, we're able to get layers of stem cells, mm -hmm. um, true stem cells, um, and we are able to uh, also get the blood from the bone marrow and ac actually make an extra rich PRP from okay. that bone marrow as well. Will you back up for just one second? Like yeah. When we're talking about stem cells, can you explain like exactly like what a stem cell is? Because Absolutely. there's a lot of confusion. Like, what is that, and what does it do? So, like, why would you like we're saying it's a big gun, but why would we want a stem cell, and what would that do over the the platelet-rich plasma? Okay. Um, well, why don't I talk about what PRP is first? Sure. Platelet-rich plasma. Yeah. Um, because that is um, when we talk about regenerative medicine mm -hmm. and, and the different biologics that we use. PRP is 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 one of one of our tools. Mm -hmm. um, the original um, regenerative medicine technique was actually using sugar water injections. Right, the prolotherapy. Prolotherapy. Yep. Um, and, and the idea behind that was the sugar water actually causes some inflammation mm -hmm. or irritation, tricks the body into thinking there's a new injury, when yep. there was a chronic issue going on. So like an ankle sprain that's been going on for a long sure. time, that kind of thing. Unstable ligaments, things like that. Exactly. Um, and then the body would then send platelets to the area, mm -hmm. then would send growth factors to the area and, and start the healing right um, so then PRP was like hey the, the way that it was kind of thought of originally was hey if the sugar water is causing this amount of irritation mm -hmm. and if we're injecting some blood platelets there it'll cause that amount of irritation plus it'll already have the growth factors sure it's kind of a prolotherapy plus mm -hmm. um, but since then we've actually realized that that the PRP is much much more than just prolotherapy plus yeah. PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Yeah. When you cut yourself, the platelets are the thing that stops the bleeding. Sure, and it's it back together. Yep, on yep. the clot. Mm -hmm. um, and then those uh, platelets release growth factors over time. Sure. Some of those growth factors actually, we've discovered, actually cause inflammation. Yes. Some of those growth factors actually are anti-inflammatory. Okay. And some of those growth factors may actually bring other cells to the area. Sure, like there's kind of that proliferation of things coming to the space. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you think about it, if you injure yourself with a cut or you twist your ankle or whatever, mm -hmm. after the platelets stabilize that injury, mm -hmm. um, they need to bring certain cells to the area like macrophages to actually get rid of the damaged tissue. Right. And that process is called inflammation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get our swelling and heat and redness and all that stuff. That's exactly right. And that's why how we've, we've actually changed the way we treat ankle sprains now, right? right? We used to... Ice, elevate, rest. Completely Com immobilize, <laughs> put yourself in a boot or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that has changed drastically now because we want that inflammation to right. occur. We don't want that to be slowed because that's our own our body's own natural process, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what the platelets do is, is, is they call cells to the area, they mm -hmm. cause inflammation, and then they take that inflammation away. So we're able to take your blood, highly, highly concentrate mm -hmm. those platelets, and then inject those into various different areas. Sure. Um, so that's what we used for, for Tammy. First round. First round. Yeah. Now, stem cells are a little bit of a different animal. Mm -hmm. So when most people think of stem cells, they're thinking of embryonic stem cells. Sure. I was going to say Kobe Bryant, but embryonic yeah. is probably a better one. Yeah, well, it was interesting. Kobe Bryant, um, the, the original treatment that mm -hmm. he had was not a stem cell treatment. Mm -hmm. It was a totally different animal out in Germany. Um, but you're right. Kobe Bryant and other athletes have really brought the idea of stem cells to the forefront. Yes. Um, and then it's kind of exploded. And, then, mm -hmm. you know, and now people are saying that stem cells would cure everything under the sun. Right. right. But what are stem cells? Yes. Um, you know, back in, in, in the Bush era administration, they were trying to put the kibosh on, on using embryonic stem cells right. because the risk that it could have towards an unborn fetus, right? Mm -hmm. But this is not embryonic stem cells. Right. Your embryonic or what are called pluripotent stem cells are those that can literally change into anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they go down different lines um, of, of less differentiated or more differentiated stem cells sure. that could then turn into specific structures. Mm -hmm. You have your stem cells that turn into nerves, your stem cells that turn into heart muscle, yeah. your stem cells that turn into orthopedic type issues like bone, cartilage, tendon, yeah. etc. So the ones that change into your tendon, cartilage, muscle, etc. are mm -hmm. called mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs. Mm -hmm. And that ha it can be found in rich supply in areas like your pelvis, in your bone, sure, um, or really any bone in your body. That has bone marrow. That has bone marrow, yeah. correct. Um, it can also be found in the fat, in 
okay. and actually a very, very high amount. And we'll talk about that too. Yeah. Um, but it can also be found in the blood supply, on blood vessels, et cetera, mm. um, just in lesser quantities. Sure. And for this procedure, you want something that has a really high concentration. Correct. So you're going to go to a source where you can really pull that. Absolutely. And so that's why we use the bone marrow. Um, the bone marrow uh, source of MSCs mm -hmm. is, is the source that has been the most researched, mm -hmm. um, by far has the most publications and research in the orthopedic world. Um, and it is the only source of MSCs that is technically legal by the FDA. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the FDA. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, it's, it's sometimes they're very, very stringent when they don't need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, quite frankly, they, they have these rules in place ultimately for patient safety. Sure. Um, and the reason the FDA says that bone marrow is legal and mm -hmm. that other sources are illegal is because um, bone marrow falls into specific categories. Less than minimal manipulation, so it's okay. not not changed in terms of its structure. Yeah. Um, it's autologous use. It's used for orthopedic conditions, mm -hmm. which, you know, bone marrow has a very similar kind of uh, use in general in sure. the body. Um, and, and versus things like uh, your fat, mm -hmm. the, the way to actually get stem cells from fat, you have to chemically digest it. Interesting. Which actually changes the fat and creates a solution called SVF, which mm -hmm. is a solution that contains the stem cells. Okay. And that, per the FDA, they consider that more than minimal manipulation, okay. and therefore creating a drug. Sure. Now, um, you can argue, is that actually creating a drug or not? Yeah. But the reason the FDA has taken this stance is because A, there's not enough research on it. Okay. Although there is some mm -hmm. growing research in it. But B, more importantly, clinics across the country have started creating that SVF and injecting it IV and saying that they're curing everything sure. and it's become this whole crazy world that has no proof, no evidence, mm -hmm. not only of efficacy, but more importantly, even safety. Sure. They just don't know yet. We don't know yet. Yeah. It, it might be the best thing since sliced bread, but we just don't know at right. this juncture. And to a certain extent, we have to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, so the FDA says no to that. It's actually started shutting down a bunch of clinics. Right, because I've had a number of patients who have come in saying that they've had stem cells through that method. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it's clearly happening even you know kind of in our area. And yeah. so, like that's a that's a really good you know good information because people are always wondering like, well, you know, could I just get like my liposuction and then stem cells simultaneously? Because that sounds fabulous, and yeah. we live in LA. <laughs> but <laughs> clearly, like if this isn't a safe thing, then we need to be. Maybe not doing that or rethinking it, or at least until we know more. Until we know more. Yeah. A and the truth is, and, and this is, look, I'm, I'm going to go on a lot of tangents here, right? So it's just fine. reel me back in if you need. <laughs> um, but that's, that's also why we're developing this field of what's called interventional orthopedics. Mm -hmm. Because stem cells aren't magic. No. Right? So that being said, we want to be able to do specific things with those stem cells or uh, any orthobiologic, mm -hmm. we want to be able to target specific structures that are necessary to be targeted. So if somebody comes to me like a Tammy with her foot pain, yeah. um, is it appropriate to just shove stem cells IV and just say that because they're magic, they're going to mm -hmm. reach her plantar fascia yeah. and reach her back and treat all these things? Or do we need precise image guidance to see that we're going at these exact structures? Sure. Right? So there's a lot of folks that, that have clinics where they do liposuction. Their mm -hmm. primary specialty is plastic surgery. Yeah. And they're like, hey, I'm also going to treat your spine condition. Yeah. Right? It's, it's outside of their scope of medicine. And, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, it's inappropriate. So it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But right. Yeah. Oh, it's happening. And it's mm -hmm. happening all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and, that's, and that's the thing. You know, anybody can call themselves a stem cell expert mm -hmm. at this juncture because there's no real certification, uh, certification or, yeah. or anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that, that that's just not appropriate as a panache. It's not mm -hmm. appropriate to treat everybody that has everything no. when you have a very focused specialty. Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, going back to my background, right, yeah. I'm focused on the musculoskeletal system. Mm -hmm. The orthopedic part. The orthopedic yeah. part, right? So I've my, my training is in um, non-surgical orthopedics and in doing these precise injections to these specific areas. Sure. Right? 
I had further training in interventional orthopedics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been practicing this for four and a half years of purely doing this. Yeah, so, just this. Right. I'm not yeah. on the side treating somebody's acne and yeah. their dementia, right? No. So, or, or doing liposuction uh, for <laughs> cosmetic reasons. So, you know, that's, you know, for, for patients out there, if you go to a website and they say that, you know, you'll, they'll be able to cure 100% of all diseases or they're treating multiple different things, yeah. you, you got to ask the right questions. Right? Maybe you run the other way. Or, or at the very yeah. least, delve into it further and figure out why, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Ask more questions, which they, people are bad at because they just assume that you're a doctor, so you know what you're talking about. And so often, no, people just don't ask appropriate questions because they think that whatever the doctor is telling them is kind of the word of God, you yeah. know? And people need to be better advocates for themselves. That's, that's absolutely right. Oh. And it's a weird world that we live in. Again, another aside. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a weird world that we live in because on one hand, there's a lot of skepticism for docs that are in the traditional world. Sure. Right? Because those are the docs that are slinging opioids. Those are the yeah. docs that are doing unnecessary surgeries. Mm -hmm. But then on the world that has is still fairly experimental, for some reason, patients trust those docs and are like, all right, I'm going to give you $10,000 to put things God knows where. Right? Yeah. So it's this weird dichotomy. It's this weird mm -hmm. uh, unbalance that's occurred in, in the musculoskeletal world right now. Oh, and the, absolutely. It's like the things you hear and what people are, like you said, aren't, aren't trusting. I mean, there's no real sense to it, yeah. but maybe it's driven by media or, you know, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's why I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this and, and, and thank you for bringing me on <laughs> because it's great to educate people about what, yeah. what's real and what's not. Oh. Well, speaking of patients, let's loop back to Tammy because yeah. we got... Woof, woof. Way, way off, track. Uh, way, way off on our ta tangents. <laughs> so let's talk about we the second round. So the second round, we've got the the amniotic. What did you call it? Not amniotic fluid. Uh, yeah. But so it's it's an allograft, meaning mm -hmm. that it's it's a, a graft tissue essentially, even though it is a fluid. Yeah. Um, that comes from uh, an allergenic source or a donor. Sure. Um, and ultimately, what it is is growth factors. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I did was, um, under ultrasound guidance, yeah. um, I could see the plantar fascia. Mm -hmm. um, the plantar fascia has layers of tissue, essentially. Right. And even though the MRI showed that the tear had healed completely, I could see that there was little slivers of mm -hmm. stuff that were going on in there. So putting my needle through those fibers, um, I put the amniotic tissue to kind of coat the inside of what tears were remaining. Mm -hmm. And then I put bone marrow stem cells throughout that region. Sure. Um, I also treated the other ligaments and tendons that were involved as a part right of Right on the vertical. ankle and yeah, just exactly. working on restabilizing. And exactly. Um, now, did you do the, do you remember, did you do the spine the second time or did we leave that alone? I think we left that alone. Yeah, because that was doing better. It was doing better. Yeah. And, and, and functionally on physical examination, her strength mm -hmm. had improved. She was, she was, for all intents and purposes, moving the way that she should be mm -hmm. um, above the ankle. Yeah. Um, so we really just needed to work on the ankle at that point. Right. Um, and then, of course, I, I had her, um, you know, uh, doing the rehab that was right. necessary. And, and that's really the work that you did with working mm -hmm. with her is, is, is what got her going. Um, and it wasn't just me. So, I mean, we, this was kind of a team approach. So there's you and I involved, you know, and you're obviously doing the injectable treatments. She and I were doing restabilization, soft tissue manipulation, gait training, all these things. But then we had, there's an acupuncturist involved right. who is helping right. with improving circulation, pain management, and a chiropractor involved too, helping, you know, with, you know, just spine alignment, pelvic alignment, kind of helping to keep everything there happy. Yeah. Yeah, because she was in a boot, on crutches. There are a lot of things, right, that were kind of contributing to her overall discomfort for a while as she was in this recovery phase. Sure. So we had lots of different people kind of with their hands on this process. And, and that's the important thing, right? Having a, the proper team mm -hmm. um, is, is really important in these yeah. situations. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of folks that do these type of regenerative treatments mm -hmm. will be like, hey, here's the treatment, and go. Go, yeah. Um, and truthfully, the treatment is only a piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the prehabilitation, the exercise leading up to getting the biomechanics yeah. as good as possible, and the rehabilitation, perhaps more so, mm -hmm. continuing on with that process is what's necessary. And having everyone be communicating. I mean, that this team approach only works if... Everyone's on board. Everyone's compute, you know, com, um, communicating, working towards you know, a common goal. Yeah. You know, if everyone's kind of off doing their own things, it does not, you know, work well. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, doesn't make sense for anyone. Yeah. 
Oh. And, and especially with these biologics, um, mm -hmm. you know, in this circumstance, with, with more of an acute injury that we're actually trying to heal the plantar mm -hmm. fascia, at least get it as functional as possible, yeah. um, if we just put stem cells there, it might not do anything. Mm -hmm. But we need that tissue to move the yeah. way that it should be moving. Mm -hmm. That feedback is actually how healing takes place in an appropriate way. Sure. We've got that feedback loop between the nerves and the brain, the tissues, and Absolutely. the tissues have to, like you were talking about how like they're kind of disorganized. Like we have to get them to lay back down in a more organized fashion That's right. so that we've got the extensibility, elasticity that comes back into the tissues, That's right. making sure that people are moving in effective movement patterns because if they're moving dysfunctionally, that disorganization is just going to come right back, That's you know, and then we've, right. we've lost the whole thing, you yeah. know, so that these things are really important. And also, you know, we have talked about like, we're kind of doing this combination of you know, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory treatment, yeah. but we're trying to get that proliferation, right? So you've got somebody who isn't moving well, you know, so having a rehab specialist coming in and helping them to move and get blood flow and circulation on that area, like, that's all highly necessary because otherwise the treatment is not going to be nearly as complete as it could have been. Yeah. The, the line that I use with, with all my patients is that I, I could put stem cells till the cows come home, mm -hmm. but if they're not moving correctly, it's yeah. completely worthless. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're you know, talking about Tammy, like where she's at now, you know, now she's back in her shoes. She's talking. She is talking. That was yeah. not exactly what she I meant to say at all. She talking before. <laughs> <laughs> we really fixed that. Not what I meant to say. You know, she's, she's, what I meant to say is that her psyche is, is improved. You know, yeah. She's coming in and when we're, t when I'm talking with her, yeah. you know, the first thing that out of her mouth isn't my foot, right. you know, which is so important is that, you know, she's back doing the things she loves. She's back exercising again, which is really important for obviously overall um, overall well-being, but it was one of her main goals. Sure. She's working her big crazy days, doing all the kids stuff. So now we're in a phase where you know she's she's meeting these goals, yeah. and we avoided all the opioids, we avoided the cortisones, we avoided the surgeries, and we've had really a successful case with her. Yeah, she's so. she's been one of our all stars by all means. Yeah, um, she's really done fantastic. With mm -hmm. it. And, and but an important thing to realize though is that. You know, even though we were able to get such great success out of this, mm -hmm. does she have a 12-year-old's foot again? No. Absolutely not. It's not like we gave her a new foot. You know, oh, yeah. we, we haven't regrown her spine. Mm -hmm. We haven't regrown her foot. We've stabilized things. Yes. We've improved the function of these tissues. We've mm -hmm. healed some tissues to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we can't reverse the clock of, reverse the hands of the clock. Yeah, yeah. there like you go. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, the truth is we can get patients functional uh, with decreased pain and, and living their lives yes right? so th I think that's that's where this teamwork approach is really mm -hmm. fantastic that's awesome so like, we, this is we've all been talking about the plantar fascia so yeah. we've had a lot of other patients you know we won't talk so extensively but let's talk about just maybe some of the other cr kind of um, common conditions that you would find would be appropriate for these type of treatments like who are people that when you see them in clinic, you're like, yep, this is something that we can generally help? Because sure. obviously, again, this isn't like we're trying to treat everything. Right. So what are some of the common conditions that you would suggest might be a, a good candidate to at least come in for a consultation? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the things that I think we can help. Mm -hmm. um, but, but first, let me talk about the things that I can't help. Sure. Um, because I think that's equally, if not more important, right? Yeah, because, absolutely. You know, if, if anyone's listening to this and saying, hey, you know, I have X condition, mm -hmm. um, is it worth it to come in to, to see me, right? Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, the things that, that I can't help. Sure. Um, when we have patients that have had multi-traumas or, or, you know, fractures that mm -hmm. are displaced and, you sure. know, major orthopedic traumas, mm -hmm. those need orthopedic surgery. Yes, sure. or complete ruptures. Complete. You know, like a, a muscle tendon that's ruptured and retracted. Absolutely. We're not going to be able to pull that thing back with this type of treatment. Absolutely. Oh. Um, so an example of that is the ACL in the knee. Sure. Um, you know, we hear of the ACL being torn in football players, basketball players, and every, every day, every yeah. people, right? Soccer players and, mm -hmm. and young girls playing soccer and landing Tons funny, tearing of those. it, right? That's all yeah. the time, all day. Um, and we hear a lot about ACL repair surgery, mm -hmm. um, especially with common in the media with, with our professional athletes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we've actually realized at this juncture that for partial thickness ACL tears, and even some full thickness ACL tears, mm -hmm. we may actually be able to heal the ligament. Mm 
okay. um, using a patient's own bone marrow stem cells and blood growth factors. Sure. Um, and and uh, the folks that have trained me, the folks that I work with, have developed a way of actually injecting both bundles of the ACL under x-ray guidance and getting mm -hmm. that precise injection in order to actually heal it. And we've had a lot of patients that have had some tremendous success with it. Yeah. That said, you mentioned when the, the tear is so bad that it's retracted, mm -hmm. you know, if this is the ligament here and the tear is like this, that's one thing. Yeah. But if the tear is like this and we're flapping in the wind, there's nothing we can do to bring that together. Yeah, it has to be approximated in some way. Exactly. You know, and this might be something that you could do after a surgery. Potentially. Or maybe even in a surgery. Potentially. But not it's not gonna fix that full retraction. That's exactly right. And same so thing with rotator cuff tears. I mean that's something we both see. Tears. You know, it's like you've got a retracted supraspinatus tendon, like yep. or whatever. I mean that's that's we can't get that pulled back down. That's that's exactly mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, if, if the fibers are completely dissociated, then that yeah. needs surgery. Now, correction. Mm -hmm. That could need surgery. Could need surgery. Um, a lot of times people don't have surgery because functionally they're okay. Perfectly fine. And the pain isn't unmanageable. And, and that's what a lot of people it. don't realize, right? Yeah. Because a rotator cuff tear does not necessarily equal pain or dysfunction. No. Same thing with an ACL tear. Right? Absolutely. Especially when patients are getting a little bit older mm -hmm. and they have an ACL tear, does that mean that they need to get it repaired? Not necessarily. Depends on what their goals are, right? What their goals are and what mm -hmm. their function is, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have an, a rotator cuff tear, but you're able to do this, yeah. All right. Or this. Right. Or that. There's right? the wing. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you may not need surgery, right? Right. Or if you have an ACL tear, but you feel stable, mm -hmm. then you may not need surgery. Um, we have to be realistic with what's going to happen 10 years from now, right? You're mm -hmm. going to develop arthritis in that knee. Yes. Uh, or that shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, but that would happen even if you had the surgery. Right. Because um, you still had a trauma. That's exactly right. Yeah. And with a, something like an ACL surgery, the, the fibers, um, you're, you're never going to have the same proprioception mm -hmm. um, that, that you uh, had with your original ACL. Sure. So there's always going to be some level of arthritis that increases mm -hmm. in that. And that's been shown in the literature as well. Yeah. Um, but if you need that knee for functioning, if you're unstable with right. that ACL, if you are a professional athlete, or have aspirations to be very, very sure. active, and you're feeling that instability, mm -hmm. then that is a reason that surgery may be necessary. Yeah. Um, but you know, I had a, 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 a dancer, a, ball, a, a ballet dancer, ballerina, ballerina, um, who is 65 <laughs> years old okay. um, and still dancing, um, and she had an ACL tear repair okay. um, several years ago, and her knees never felt the same. Sure. Um, and that happens a lot. And that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and especially with, you know, someone like a ballerina who's very, very attuned to her body. Yes. Um, even subtle things, for all intents and purposes, her knee is stable. Mm -hmm. But those subtle things she was was feeling, she she wasn't able to turn the way that she wanted to. Sure. You know, and dance the way that she wanted to. Um, in any case, it, it's, it's one of those things that, um, those are the situations that even if you do have a major ACL tear, mm -hmm. Um, but you're feeling stable and you want to try to avoid surgery, we may be able to use biologics to strengthen all the other ligaments in the area, sure. change the negative environment inside the mm -hmm. joint, try to prevent things from getting worse, or at least slow down the progress of the arthritis, right. not necessarily grow back the ACL in that, in that situation, yeah. um, but still potentially help. But kind of give that kind of global stability that's needed, that's exactly just right. in a different way. That's exactly right. Oh. And the same thing goes with rotator cuff tears. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there is a less of a retraction, if there is a small tear in the rotator yeah. cuff, we may actually be able to provide benefit. And we've had some cases of actually healing those rotator cuff mm -hmm. tears. Well, I can use mine as a, an example. I mean, you've done my shoulder twice now, but two years apart. You know, and it wasn't like you just injected intra, like into the, the joint itself. We were doing multiple tendons, then we were doing the actual labrum itself and doing things to stabilize globally as well as the tear site, yeah. you know, and, and that's was super successful without having to do the surgeries and whatnot, but, you know, dumb and did another injury. So, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> had that not happened. Not dumb and did another injury, but lived a Yeah. <laughs> I should have asked for help lifting that box, but Fair like, enough. yeah, <laughs> usually fine. So, but I mean, the important thing to know is that like the function is there, the pain is manageable, and we, we were doing something more global you know we weren't just trying to fix 
a tear site, you know, and working on that general stabi stability and obviously working on rehabbing myself and building strength and all that stuff on top of it. Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, that, that's, that can be highly successful. And, and that's so. a, the great thing is we can provide benefit in terms of pain and function mm -hmm. and strength of certain tissues without resorting to things like cortisone injections, sure. which, which may actually make tendon issues worse. Yeah, weaken um, it. Weaken it. Mm -hmm. um, especially if they're unguided injections, which yeah. a lot of folks are doing, don't use any image guidance to mm -hmm. try to inject into the shoulder. And theoretically, anybody can kind of inject into the shoulder, mm -hmm. right? It's a big thing. But if it gets yeah. into the tendon, it can cause a tear. Right. Um, you know, I've seen patients that had uh, biceps tendon inflammation, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they had injections of cortisone without any image guidance to mm -hmm. where the biceps tendon is, and they went from just having inflammation to a full-on rupture. Then. Yeah, and so, this is like, oh my God, my, the soapbox that I get on with patients about this, because for me as a therapist, I'm the one having to deal with them for months on end. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm just saying we have a multi-month relationship. Yeah. You know, yeah. they go to see their orthopedic surgeon, they have even a, a small tear, or like you said, a tendonitis, tendonitis, tendinosis, they get cortisone, and we go from a minor condition to full rupture, yeah. and now we're looking at surgery. Yeah. You know, so it's it, as much as I can, I'm trying to guide patients away from having the cortisone because yeah. where it has its place when we're talking about these tendinous tissues and these like these structural support tissues, it just really isn't doing them any favors. Right. You know, and, and we used to do it more because we didn't have other solutions. Yeah. You know, now we have other solutions which might be better solutions, so why not go to that route, you know, that route? Absolutely. So. And, and don't get me wrong, I think cortisone has its place. It does, for sure. But quite frankly, as time progresses and research progresses, that, that window of what we should be using cortisone for is smaller and smaller. smaller and smaller. Absolutely. So, like, you know, for the back and sciatica, for example, mm -hmm. um, if somebody is young, has no other medical issues, yeah. has an isolated disc bulge that's irritating a nerve, mm -hmm. then okay, maybe Might be appropriate. an epidural steroid injection is appropriate. Yeah. That's not typically the patients that we see, though. Right? No, and we do have them occasionally, but yeah. like that's that falls in our, our small window of something that, yes, give that a shot, yeah. you know, but. But if it only works for two or three months, mm -hmm. certainly shouldn't be repeating that over and over again. No, because mm -hmm. obviously we're not treating the underlying problems like we talked about, right. and there's other things that need to be addressed, not just bandaged. That's exactly you know? right. And a lot of times when, when situations like that, people go to their doc, they get that injection, and they don't talk about rehab afterwards. No, they don't. Because they had their, uh, the cortisone works to calm mm -hmm. down the inflammation, so they feel less pain, yeah. but they don't think about what caused the issue in the first place. Right. And the therapy or rehab or whatever isn't being pushed because the patient's not in pain. And so many people, if they could come in preventatively, you know, we could like literally do prehab with them yeah. versus chasing the pain and chasing the dysfunction when someone's in a lot of, of discomfort. I mean, it'd be so much easier to hit it on the front end. Absolutely. You know, those are my favorite patients to see is like, you know, I've got this little problem, but I want to make sure this doesn't come back. Awesome. Like, I want that. And people always joke with me. They're like, isn't that bad business? <laughs> like, bad business for you? Like, you're preventing this person from needing four months of surgery? I'm like, absolutely not. Because if I prevent you from needing surgery or having more cortisone, you're going to send all your family and friends, yeah. you know, because yeah. yeah. now you really like me because this, you know, yeah. didn't turn into a bigger problem. And yeah. I love those cases. And, and, and oh. I think that's the, the main thing, right? Because mm -hmm. you're, you're helping people yeah, and you're being honest with people and you're preventing more invasive things. Right. That's the, that's the thing, you know? Um, yeah, you might stop them from coming to see you more, right? But so that's, it's bad business, bad. but it's good patient care. Absolutely. And, the, the worst thing, I was actually just um, on, on a physician group on Facebook, mm -hmm. and, and somebody was talking about how um, they had sent a patient somewhere uh, for cortisone injections in, in both shoulders okay. and, and a knee. And they had a lot. ridiculously, yeah, but they all they had a ridiculous high amount of cortisone that was mm -hmm. injected in all those three areas, and they were asking, like, is this normal to have this amount of cortisone injected? Yeah. And, and people were like, um, no, this is yeah. not normal. Maybe it's a, an error on their documentation mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. Um, but I was like, look, there are actually groups out there, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not kidding here. There are groups out there that are like, all right, let's throw whatever we can at them. Yeah. We don't really care if it works or not mm -hmm. because the next lineup is going to be the surgery. Right, and it's kind of like almost, you almost feel like they're trying to push people in that direction a little yeah. bit because like, 
it isn't good patient care because they're not looking out for the patient. They're just kind of patching it and going like, well, if this doesn't work, I'll cut you, right. which is really unfortunate. And what's worse yet is that with those high levels of cortisone injections, mm -hmm. we now know that cortisone actually makes arthritis worse, yeah. especially repeated injections, especially high levels, mm -hmm. right? So it's a great business model. Yeah. You know, let's do a bunch of a really, really high cortisone injection that mm -hmm. may reduce the pain temporarily, yeah. but then they keep on coming back because it's temporary and it makes the arthritis worse, so then you end up having to have surgery. Sure, it's just right? bad patient care all around. It is immoral. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was, uh, years ago, I, I was looking uh, at, at jobs, and there, a buddy of mine told me about a job in Texas. Okay. Um, and in looking into it further, they were doing epidural steroid injections for the low back. Okay. But they didn't want their physicians to use the x-ray in multiple views and make sure that the needle was in the right place. That's they were just, just dangerous. Like, just go in and go out. It doesn't matter if you're in the right place because they were a surgical team. And they had money in. This the, makes me cringe. It, it's, and this isn't, this isn't the norm. <laughs> no, 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 but still. Most people aren't like this. Mm -hmm. But they had money in their ambulatory surgical center. They had money mm -hmm. in their surgical equipment a company yeah. and, and all of that. So, you know, they that was where they were bringing money in. So they had somebody in doing conservative care, but ultimately mm -hmm. it was just pushing people towards surgery. Yeah. Um, rumor is that Texas is notorious for this type of care. I've heard of several clinics like okay. this. Not everybody is like this. No. I know and am personally uh, colleagues and friends with good surgeons. Yeah. And quite frankly, I do think surgery is absolutely necessary mm -hmm. in many, many situations, but the system has become crap. You yeah. Know? Um, but yeah, talk about a tangent there. Yeah, I mean, we can get on, go for that on that for a while. <laughs> oh, so we talked about, you know, we've talked about a little bit of ACLs. Um, we talked about rotator cuff a little, tears a little bit. Yeah. What would be other appropriate things, you know, for people to come in for? Like, just, uh, you know, ballpark, just a few things that are, are common. And then I have a specific question. Sure. Oh. Um, so for things like PRP, the platelet-rich plasma, mm -hmm. um, the, the most research is actually for things like tennis elbow. Okay. Um, things like uh, mild to moderate knee osteoarthritis. Okay. Um, and if I was to wager a guess as to what's going to be covered by insurance for PRP in the When that future, ever happens, yeah. yeah. Um, I think those would be the areas that would probably be first. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps tendinopathy irritation on the outside of the, the hip. I think okay. that's called greater trochanter. Sure. Um, so these are the areas that there's most research at this juncture. Okay. The problem is the research is all over the place because mm -hmm. PRP is not just PRP. Yeah. There's multiple different ways of making PRP. And we've realized that different types of PRP are beneficial in different conditions. Sure. Like we were talking about before, where the styles are coming from, or Correct. et cetera. Correct. So mm -hmm. the different biologics are necessary for different conditions, and we're mm -hmm. still figuring that out. Um, but we are really able to make those various different things, and that's why we are specializing in this versus yeah. somebody that might just be doing this on the side. Right? Yes, and that's part of what's so great is that this is what you guys do. Absolutely. You know, it's not like you're going to see somebody else that this is like a side cash, you know, it's kind of a side hustle, Absolutely. you know, and that sounds bad, but you know, that this isn't their primary thing, right. you know, for you guys, this is the primary thing. So you guys are doing the research, you have the, the numbers here. We're collecting the data. Collecting data, and, yeah. And making sure we know what we can and cannot treat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at our data, we do have benefit with PRP for milder arthritis conditions, mm -hmm. um, for tendinopathy or irritation to the tendons, like disorganized fibers of right. the tendons. Um, we do have benefit for um, more minor spine conditions. Yeah. So uh, uh, arthritis to the facet joints. Right. Um, we use a variation of PRP called platelet lysate, mm -hmm. which is more of a soothing anti-inflammatory immediate release of growth factors sure. versus PRP, which actually causes inflammation first. Right. And that platelet lysate I can use in the epidural space instead of an epidural steroid injection. Right, it kind of could take the place of that cortisone we were talking about earlier. Absolutely, and, yeah. and more so than just taking the place of it mm -hmm. um, because it, it has that anti-inflammatory effect. And the growth factors. And the growth factors. Yeah, that's um, important distinction. Yeah, so we've had benefit, we've had patients that had nerve damage actually have improved of their nerve function mm -hmm. with using that platelet lysate into the epidural space or into peripheral nerves or whatnot. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we, we can even treat muscle conditions with PRP and, and uh, platelet derivatives. Okay. Um, so, uh, for example, I had a case of a patient who had nerve damage okay. after an um, uh, 
accident. Okay. Um, and he actually had surgery, mm -hmm. had improvement, ended up having to have a second surgery, okay. after which he had significant atrophy of his sure. muscles. Sure, all that weakness. All that weakness. He literally couldn't lift his arm. He had zero out of five strength. I saw him several months later, and his surgeon was like, hey, we just gotta wait two years and see what grows back. Right. Um, but nothing was growing. Um, so we were like, look, we can try to do this. This mm -hmm. is still very experimental, but we yeah. have had success at getting nerves to function better. With that um, introduction of the growth hormones. Exactly, with the growth factors. Growth factors, um, not growth exactly. hormones. Um, <laughs> but, so we injected along the nerves in yeah. the neck, um, and he started to get some tingling. Okay. So we started injecting also into the various muscles as well. Okay. After a few injections of injecting the nerves, mm -hmm. we continued to inject into the muscles, mm -hmm. and he actually had regrowth of muscle and re -improvement, an improvement of his strength. That's Very great. substantial improvement. Yeah, cause com coming from a zero out of five, which is like, if people don't know this, like zero out of five means you can't move. I and mean, we're talking flaccid Correct. muscle. Like there is nothing there. That's right. So for coming back from that, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And he didn't get to five out of five. He didn't get to complete strength. Yeah. Um, actually, in some areas he got close, but he was like four out of five, four plus out of five. Mm -hmm. um, he was a three out of five at some muscles, but he, he had some substantial improvement. Sure. It was actually really emotional for for me and my <laughs> staff. Like he came in giving high fives. Oh, that's and, huge. And throwing punches. Yeah. And, and he returned to swimming, which he loved. Like mm -hmm. it was just a, it was a great, great story. That's and, really cool. And yeah, it was really cool. But see, that's that's a situation where it's a little bit more of an acute injury right. where we actually did regeneration. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these conditions like arthritis, we're not actually regenerating the joint. Right, you're not growing more cartilage. Correct. Which people think that's what's happening. They think, oh, they're gonna inject this and I'm growing the cartilage back. Correct. Not exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. and that's and that's the thing because on, on going back to all these scan clinics that are out there, mm -hmm. there's people that are making those claims. Right. Um, and they're trying to show actually before and after X-rays even. Um, I'll, I got to show you this. Uh, one of my one of my partners. <laughs> this can be one of our things that we like like have like on a demo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, when one of one of my partners sent me a picture of a patient's ankles. Okay. Uh, her X-rays of her ankles and that she had taken before and after at this clinic that she visited that did some umbilical stem cell treatment okay. and said that they were going to regrow her cartilage. Okay. She had no improvement, mm -hmm. surprise, she had really bad arthritis, but they did the repeat x-ray yeah. and they measured the joint space to show that the cartilage had grown. Okay. Just so the audience knows, x-ray yeah. does not show cartilage. Right. It shows joint space, but mm -hmm. it does not show cartilage. Doesn't show any sort of soft tissue. Correct. Yeah. Um, and they <laughs> measured it and said, look, the measurement has grown. The size of the joint space has grown. The size they, of the joint space has grown? Yeah. Okay. But they actually measured it at a completely different location. Oh. At a completely different location. <laughs> Just moved the marker down a little uh -huh. bit and measured at a different location. Sure. And showed the patient, hey, look, see? Yeah. The measurements And how would the improved. patient know? The patient this isn't, doesn't know. The patient doesn't know. So the, to them, this probably looked awesome. Yep. Like, you know, you know? like, even though my pain is still the same as it was before, mm -hmm. at least I'm regrowing my cartilage, right? Yeah. So um, it was it was really sad. We see this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see patients with before, before and after X-rays of the knees, um, but they show the knees and they show a joint space like this that's okay. completely narrowed, and then they show the next one that's actually increased, but the angle of the X-ray is completely different. Wrong. Okay. So you got to look at where the kneecap is in the picture, right? Right, Because right. the kneecap is in a different location, then the x-ray is taken at a different angle. Yeah, right? it's like comparing apples to oranges now. Like, it's not the same it's thing. It's not the same. Yeah. So in those settings, in more chronic degenerative conditions, we mm -hmm. may still be able to improve pain, improve function mm -hmm. with targeted injections into various ligament structures. We may be able to improve the strength around the knee joint or the whatever joint, um, but we can't regrow the cartilage. Yeah. We can't reverse the arthritis that has taken right. place. Again, we're not putting the clock back. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. Well, specific kind of question. So, you know, in my clinic space, we do a lot of orthopedics. Yeah. We are also doing pelvic health. And to be specific, we're doing pelvic health as a generalization. Not just women's pelvic health, but also men and, and the whole spectrum. Everyone, doesn't matter your gender, has a pelvic floor. Yeah. I think we can agree on that. Yeah. But People get confused. Like a lot of times men don't realize that they have a pelvic floor yeah. also. But with women, one of the questions I get often is we get the a postpartum or after childbirth clientele base. Yeah. And one of the biggest questions I get is what can I do about my diastasis recti? And I wanted to talk to you about this specifically because yeah. this is a question that's over and over asked because 
women are very concerned about getting their waistline back, yeah. being able to get their abdominal strength back, both for function and aesthetics, and it's a big concern for them. So in that population, is there something that you guys do here that could help with helping that diastasis to close or become more thickened, things to kind of help to rebuild that for this population? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a, an, an emerging area that mm -hmm. I think we may be able to help. So um, interesting story about that actually. Several years ago, three, four years, three, mm -hmm. three and a half years ago, um, I was actually treating some, some guys with okay. low back issues. Sure. Um, and I had some improvement of their nerve function, but I wasn't able to get them to strengthen their core to take pressure on okay. that area. So on follow-up, you know, even though they had improvement of most of their symptoms, I, I wanted to make sure we had some longevity, so I was mm -hmm. really focusing on getting them core strength. And I realized that, that there was something wrong. Okay. So they had that diastasis. Sure, and in so. the men, we usually talk about like some sort of like an abdominal hernia, right? Versus using that same term. Yeah, and, oh. and but but the truth is that's what it is. It is same a thing. diastasis, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that thinning of thinning of the linea alba, and it's right. the ab muscles are separating another space. That's exactly yeah. right, and and it happens quite frequently in in both men and females, mm -hmm. um, and it can be something that's there since birth, um, sure. and it just could be the way that you are. Mm -hmm. um, but in this particular population, it was uh, some men that had gained and lost weight. Okay. Um, so if you think about what pregnancy is, right, yeah. ultimately that is stretching of the abdomen, mm -hmm. um, stretching of the linea alba between yeah. the recti, um, and, and then coming back. But that linea alba ends up being stretched, it ends right. up being fragile. Thin. Thin. Yeah. Um, even, even wavy in appearance mm -hmm. because it has been stretched. And now, you know, if you think of it like a, a thick rubber band, yeah. Um, and then you slowly stretch that rubber band, right. but then you put it back into position, what's going to happen? It's going to be Yeah, it doesn't have that same integrity that it did the first right. time. That same elasticity, mm -hmm. that same strength, right? Yeah. Um, tensile strength. Um, so ultimately, um, I was like, all right, you know, I have this patient population. And then I started seeing it more. I started examining it more and seeing it more. And this is something that we don't learn about in depth in medical school or in mm -hmm. residency training or whatnot. But I remember that in, in my residency when I was all on the East Coast, I, I remember seeing uh, someone that in, in New York City that had developed a, an abdominal strengthening program okay. um, for diastasis that mm -hmm. focused really specifically on strengthening the transverse abdominal muscles. Okay. Um, so I actually reached out to her and I was like, mm -hmm. hey, look, um, what, what's your experience with this? Can you help me out with this? Um, and we started talking. And she had mentioned that she had a lot of refractory cases. Okay. Um, she was collecting her data, so she mm -hmm. knew you know, what patients did well and what didn't. And she had cases that they did the exercise, but they still weren't able to close that gap of the sure. diastasis. Um, at, uh, in my residency program and beforehand, mm -hmm. I had actually met um, a, a, one of uh, the pioneers of some regenerative medicine techniques um, down in Washington, D.C., uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Victor Abraham. Okay. Um, and while I was following him, um, he was actually going to be working on a potential study um, to look at micronized fat in okay. the abdomen. So not stem cells, right. but just micronized fat, okay. and injecting that along the linea alba in okay. order to try to provide some healing along there. Okay. So I reached out to him and I was like, hey, what do you think about you know, just trying to inject PRP? Yeah. He loved the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I worked uh, with uh, this lady from New York on a few different patients. We did her exercises for a few weeks, mm -hmm. and then with ultrasound guidance, I injected along the linea alba, okay. and then they continued on with her exercises. We followed these patients out to a couple months, and then even several months later, and did before and after pictures. Okay. Uh, we did before and after um, measurements by hand. Yeah. Uh, we did before and after measurements under ultrasound, so okay. seeing the thick, the, the width of the linea alba yeah. as well as the thickness the depth of the connective of it. tissue. Yeah. yeah, and we were very pleasantly surprised to see some pretty substantial benefit in all of our cases. Now, okay. um, we, we only did a limited number of cases, right. um, and this wasn't a formal study. There wasn't no you know control that we did or anything sure. along those lines. But these, some of these uh, patients were patients that had done her program previously okay. and still had a diastasis. Fascinating. Um, so it was really, really interesting. Um, and since then, um, I have worked with other physical therapists that work with patients and strengthening the transverse mm -hmm. abdominal muscles and doing that in concert with PRP along the linea alba. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Victor Abraham passed.
passed away. Oh. Um, it was actually a really big loss to our community. Um, so I, I don't think that, it, that the studies that he was doing came to mm -hmm. fruition. Okay. Um, but we were working on publishing the cases that we did. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think that this is something that could really be beneficial for a oh. lot of patients that are honestly neglected. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a population that, like you said, you didn't get a lot of formal training in this. The number of patients I have that come in to see me that their physician has never mentioned to them that this is a thing. Never heard of it. They've never heard of it. Yeah. And it's like, these are, are, are highly trained individuals, but this just isn't part of the training. Right. It's pretty, pretty unbelievable. So you might have somebody who's been struggling with this for several years before they land in someone's office that actually recognizes and knows what this is yeah. and now can do something about it. But it's really cool finding other potential treatments for this because it's a major concern for a lot of people. And, Absolutely. you know, especially like you get the population of people who are really active, you know, and they aren't able to get back to their activities because they don't have this stability in the front. Absolutely. And also two things that we know now about the use of mesh for closing hernias and, and these things, like, you know, the FDA has retracted on the mesh and said that this isn't safe. We, you know, know that that foreign body being implanted isn't great. So having a potential option is really a great thing to kind of be hopeful for. Yeah, and, and in certain situations like that, the surgery may be necessary. If there's a rip Absolutely. in the linea alba, yeah. if there's a true hernia, too hernia, wide, right? yeah. um, then those are the circumstances where surgery may actually be necessary, mm -hmm. but if we can avoid it, Absolutely. Um, you know, that's, that's really, really important. The reason that I think that this has been neglected for mm -hmm. so long is quite frankly, you fall into two categories. That category where there's a true hernia, where abdominal organs are coming out, and that's a surgical yeah. candidate, or you fall into the category that has this diastasis, mm -hmm. but doesn't have any broad symptoms that are yeah. presenting, right? It's not necessarily a painful thing. Mm -hmm. um, it causes weakness, but ultimately that weakness demonstrates as difficulty with activity, yeah. or back pain, or right. whatever else, but nobody's paying attention to, to you know the, the kink in the armor, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that that that's why it's been neglected so long, but that's why people are starting to pay attention to it a little bit more yeah. too. And you know, and a lot of people, it's like because it's an aesthetics issue, right? They're seeing maybe a plastic surgeon right. about it right. versus seeing like their OBGYN or a functional medicine pro you know provider sure. because they're looking at like how do I make this look better, right. but not really necessarily thinking about how that can make them function better. Right. Wow. And you know, I, I, I mentioned before that I, I don't like the idea of plastic surgeons doing orthopedic conditions. Right. Um, I don't consider myself an aesthetic person at mm -hmm. all, so I'm not doing this for aesthetic reasons. Yeah. Um, although I have had patients come to me um, because they do have some difficulty with their at core strength and mm -hmm. they'd love to feel aesthetically better. Right. Um, ultimately, I'm not going to be trying to you know make this look pretty, although mm -hmm. I've had that success with the patients. Yeah, but the um, goal isn't the that. Yeah, the goal and, is the and, functional part. And, and that's how I fought, fell into it, because mm -hmm. I wanted to you know, use this as, as an adjunct to the treatment that I had for a guy with back pain, right? Yeah. Um, but it ended up being very, very successful, and I've treated since a, a, a bunch of um, female that are postpartum mm -hmm. um, that have uh, this, this residual diastasis going on. And in terms of like the pelvic health world, I mean, this is an important thing to you know, talk about, is the fact that, yes, we're talking about diastasis, but a male coming in with a hernia, they're going to have the same core weakness, problems, low back pain, you know, difficulty functioning. So this is a potential treatment for both groups. Absolutely. Same problem, just called something different. Absolutely. Oh. And we're still learning a lot about it. We're still yeah. learning you know, um, where it won't and will work. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I've had more success than not. Um, and we're looking at the details of you know what length may be too long, um, or mm. you know what kind of diastasis would react better to it or not. Sure. Um, but you know it's it's certainly something to try before surgery. Yeah. Um, and and certainly needs to be done with the appropriate rehab. Right. The rehab and also like we were talking about like making sure it's the right type of cells going into it. You're right. using ultrasound guidance, right. things so that you know that you're getting it where it needs, the, getting the treatment where it needs to be and then partnering that with the rehabilitation. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, cool. Hey, I know we could talk about it, like literally keep talking for the next <laughs> day, but we yeah. should probably wrap it up. Oh, Fair thank enough. you so much for meeting up with me. I absolutely appreciate it. I appreciate you and what you do and the help you've given to me and my patient population. So no, thank you so no much. Problem. No, thank you. Honestly, thank you for having me. This has been a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> it's um, always fun. Yeah. And, and I just thank you for the opportunity to just let me explain what, what's real and what's not. God, um, and so important. We're, we're only a, 
hit the, the tip of the iceberg. So. Literally scratched the surface. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it's good information for everyone to have. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.